Hello and welcome to another webinar from the Legal and General Mortgage Club in our Spark series. Today I'm going to talk about identification and verification. For the last three to four years now, I have had many conversations uh, across the industry with our broker community and lender community. And certainly I know the broker community has been wanting to find a way that um, customers can be helped by only doing identification and verification once and ideally shared. And for so, so long, this seems to have been a, a, a pipe dream, really. And uh, um, it's been a real challenge just to even get lenders to change their circumstance and um, allow uh, the fact that the digital world has now come into play and which, for me, actually enables a more safe and secure check of, of data. Well, today I want to say to you, there is hope. There is an opportunity here. And I'm delighted to be joined by Stuart Young of MyIdentity.org, who has been working on a project for the industry to help us get to a better place and to a point that we may well be able to just do the identity check once and share it across multiple parties. So, Stuart, welcome as our saviour, potentially. Oh, thanks very much, Danny. That's a pretty good introduction. <laughs> So I understand um, that there was, so I've been involved in your project for the last, I guess, probably 12 months or so now getting getting on for, and, it, and it's made some great strides forward. Um, but you're going to run through some slides with us just to outline exactly what the, what the project is and, and, and how you've, uh, um, how you, or where you've got to so far. And then hopefully we'll sort of talk towards the end a bit more and maybe answer some of the viewers' questions as, as, to, as to what uh, may be on their mind or some of their thoughts and challenges that they may see as part of what you present. Is that okay? That's great. That sounds good, Danny. I'm good to over to you, sir. Thank you. Now. Thank you. Um, there we go. Clicking share screen. There we go. And has that gone full screen? Good. Yes, indeed. Great. There. So the scheme is actually called myidentity.org, and it's all about the role of the consumer um, within the transaction process. And I think, as Danny's highlighted very quickly there, is the big challenge within this sector is um, looking at the consumer and enabling a consumer to get their IDMV done once and once only, but have the ability to share that with all the various relying parties through the process and very importantly, for the relying parties to have the confidence to know that they can trust and use that identity rather than taking the customer through some more friction and asking them again for their passport. So the DCMS um, have been working on a digital identity and attributes trust framework for a couple of years now. And within that framework, there are schemes being set up. And this scheme is specifically designed for the home buying and selling sector. And it's about working to a set of government-backed standards for ID and V, which are compliant against the GPG 45, which is the Good Practice Guides 45, and AML compliance. So this is a, a set of standards that, that you as an industry know that you can work to, which helps to build the trust that's required around the sharing of that identity. A big change within this, though, is the certification of the identity providers who are called IDSPs. And this is really important, and I'm going to come back to this uh, later on. But it's about knowing that knowing that the person, that the third party that's done the ID and V, is certified to a set of standards that you can trust on. And very importantly, it's about helping to deal with the process of fraud. And um, we know that property fraud, property mortgage fraud, has gone up. And if we look at the Nordic countries, in Norway, for example, when they adopted one identity standard against a set of agreed standards um, where one percent of transactions were linked to fraud post introduction of the identity standard and um, fraud went down to 0.00042 percent of transactions so it had a, a fabulous massive impact to start off with and um, i think within mortgage lending and um, the big challenges for yourselves are you know can, can I trust this identity? Can I use this identity? Or do I have to take my client through another ID and V? And the role of certified providers, you know, there's different types of identity providers out there working to different standards. 
and you as a, a mortgage lender who's lend, giving out money to people or involved in managing that process need to, to be able to trust that process. And that's where the issue around standards of compliance of the certified providers comes into place. So there is some further resources about the role of financial institutions in identity verification, which you can have a look at later on. But I think within the, the, the digital identity trust scheme, there are some specific market requirements that are needed for home buying and selling, because it does take into account estate agents, conveyancers, brokers, and lenders, all working to different regulations. So how are your ID and V obligations met? Um, I won't spend too much time on these because this, the, these can be emailed out to you, but you'll see from the AML regs, it is very much about ensuring that the identity provider is accredited or certified to a set of standards, a government-backed set of standards. And the scheme is working around the GPG 45 and these standards underpin the whole of the DCMS framework. So now that we have someone who sits at the top of the food chain said, we are working to these standards. And for mortgage lending, the level of confidence that is required is medium. So this is the standard that all identity providers would have to work to, to be when they're doing an ID and V. And there's a variety of identity profiles in this process. And one of the key challenges that we've had is to ensure inclusivity so that a client or consumer is more guaranteed to get through the process because not everyone has a digital um, smartphone or has an, an NFC um, uh, passport or a driving license. There are a lot of people that still rely on documentation or come from out with the UK. So the scheme works around eight different profiles to ensure that more clients get through the pro process. They have a successful outcome. The levels of confidence, oops, um, these come through on the JMLSG and GPG45. So government is working, there's a little bit of misalignment between the JMLSG and uh, the work that DCMS are doing around the medium level of confidence, but that they're working to resolve that and we'll have that sorted out in the next short period of time. This scheme is very much looking at the ID and V and the proof of address and date of birth of the consumer in the process. This is quite an important one to pull out because the, this issue of trust and do my regulations allow this? So in October 2019, the AML regs were updated. And if I just draw your attention to the highlighted bit in yellow, where it is very, very clear now that you do, you are allowed to accept the ID and V carried out by a third party so long as that party is certified to a set of government standards or standards that are recognized by the industry. Because this has been a bit of a blocker for the industry to adopt, you know, change what they're doing to, to trust and use just one identity verification. Because quite rightly, you, you need to protect yourselves under your CD, CDD obligations. So what's been happening? How the scheme is being designed, the role of the consumer is very important in this process. And what's been happening now is the identity providers with government have been working on the provision of what's called a digital wallet, a personal data store, or an app. Um, so this is where the consumer gets their ID and V, they download it onto their smartphone, or, and it gives them the ability to control and share that. So no matter where the customer comes into the process, whether it be through an estate agent or a broker, either of those parties will get the consumer to get their ID and V done. The consumer gets it done through from one of the list certified um, providers, and they then have the ability to share that with their estate agent, their lender, their buyer's conveyancer, whomever they need to as part of the transaction process. So that means for the client, they're in control, and it helps to overcome a lot of issues around GDPR. And ultimately that works then to, to register their transaction with land registry. So the digital wallet is a big changing part in this process. And we're seeing in Europe, um, the European Union is really pushing towards all consumers having a digital wallet for their identity. But this scheme meets two government policies. That meets the DCMS in terms of what they're trying to do around the framework and empowering the consumer to get their ID and V done and share that. And 
the Department for Leveling Up Communities and Housing, it used to be called the Ministry of Housing Communities and Local Government, but it's now called DLUC, and they're responsible for housing policy, and this has gone to the top of their agenda. So this is really quite important. So it's 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 a positive for the for this for this work because it is meeting two government objectives. So it has their full backing and support, and this is reflected in the level of support we've had in the scheme through all the legal, financial, and estate agency regulators and representative bodies as well. How does the scheme work? Well, on the left, you have, and please don't read anything into this, on the left-hand side, you have a list of, a random list of identity providers who are all working to scheme certification and standards through the DCMS and through ourselves. And they contract directly with the hub. On the right-hand side, you have a list of service providers from estate agents through to lenders, and they contract with the hub. And what it means then is those service providers on the right-hand side they can use any of the identity providers on the left. They don't have to enter into one-to-one -one negotiations or contractual obligations with one IDP. It means they could use a variety of IDPs for different cases, whether it be for complex cases where, or, or, or more simple places, or to what, what we, this issue around inclusivity is trying to help people get through the process success, successfully. So having the identity providers as broad as possible in terms of the service provision is really important. So the service providers on the right can use any of those identity providers or an estate agent. Say I start my journey with an estate agent or a broker and I use um, OBID, for example. A lot of people might not have heard of OBID, but when my identity is then shared with the lender or the conveyancer, they can check against the scheme. The OBID is working to the scheme standards, and then they can trust and use that ID. So that's quite important. So it's opened up the market to more innovative and creative types of identity providers. And it's worth pointing out at the bottom of the screen, these are what we are what we call attribute providers. So you'll no doubt recognize some of the names down here, the likes of LexisNexis and GBG. So we now have within the scheme um, a couple of I attribute providers, one of them is called Armalytics, who do open banking. So as a lender or as a broker, you might use one of the identity providers to do your ID and V, but might think, actually, I need to do further checks on this person. So again, using the scheme, you can just use one of the, the attribute providers to augment your searches. So that's doing the further checks that you might have to carry out in your client. So this is very important role about what the scheme is doing. It's not defining technical standards because service providers can still carry on using your tech, the case management systems that you might use, the CRM systems you might use, and it's the same with the identity providers. So what the scheme is doing is working with the likes of Repit or the LSSA, a lot of these tech suppliers to lenders, brokers, estate agents, and conveyancers to integrate the scheme into the existing tech that's exist that, and your workflow processes. So hopefully that makes sense on that one. And then finally, what are we looking at? What, what's the benefits for the industry? Well, obviously we're always looking for the happier customer and to onboard our customer more quickly, more securely and taking the friction out of the process and that opportunity to build stronger relationships with the client and also how, how the identity can also be reused for, for the purposes of upselling other products and services to that client. Because especially when someone goes through a mortgage lending, a house purchase, there are going to be other products and services that they need to buy. Fraud is obviously a very big issue. And here's the statistic about the reduction in fraud. I think that's quite a powerful figure. And we know that digital ID and V is far more secure and be more widely adopted now by all the regulators. And operating costs for, for you as mortgage lenders and brokers, you know, the quicker you can onboard someone, reduce some of the admin. ID and V is not a competitive issue, but it is a burden. It's an administrative burden. And indeed, just this morning, I ran a session with a broker and their network of solicitors. And as one of the solicitors said on the call, I didn't sign up to be a lawyer to do ID and V. I signed up to do law, but they're finding it now to be 
a more cumbersome process for them. So I think these are some of the kind of quick wins for the industry. So ultimately, in the end, it is about from where we started, how a consumer can share their identity, share that across different organizations, the ability to control that and help tackle issues around identity fraud. But in this instance, we're tackling a very easy and identifiable use case around the home buying and selling process. Hopefully that gives you a quick overview of the My Identity Scheme. Thank you, Stuart. That, that was really helpful. So uh, I've got a few questions, if, if that's OK, and, and I'm sure there may be so one or two from the audience as, as when they're ready to commit to those. Um, I believe we're at a stage whereby we're going to try and launch a pilot. We have. So we've been working on launching a pilot since June of this year. And the we're looking actually this week, it actually goes live this week. So we are looking at taking our first transactions through the process. And the scheme is running until August next year. Um, it doesn't mean that we'll stop this, the, the, the work around my identity at the end of August. It's just we need a, a start and an end point to start to measure results. So we're just starting now until August next year. OK, but do you think if you get a significant amount of uh, uh, cases put through this to actually test the system, it could actually be brought forward and maybe, lost maybe six to nine months instead? Yep. Um, it, well, it'll take us through till August next year anyway. Um, thereafter, the, the scheme will carry on running and the, 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 the work that we're doing will still be working with DCMS and, and land registry in particular as well. And to, to look at how it's integrated then in, and how it helps to frame the, the DCMS policy and the government policy, because government are going to legislate on this. So it's a great opportunity for this scheme to help define and shape what we as a sector need. OK, so if the government are really supportive of this and things, do, do you think that they will um, perhaps be a little bit more forceful if, if potentially lenders are reluctant to play? Uh, that's a good question. I think the pressure needs to come from the financial regulators and the market. So one example that we've we've now got from the um, insurance brokers is the bet they've now publicly stated and come out and said for conveyances, for example, if they adopt these scheme standards, they can see PII cover coming down by 40 to 60 percent. And that's a phenomenal figure. And they've come out publicly and said that. So I think in terms of for, for lenders, um, they need to look at, well, what's the, what is it that they want to do? Do they want to help onboard their clients more quickly and efficiently, upsell other products and reduce operational costs, and then help de-risk the process? So I think for lenders, it's, it's more a case of looking at where's, where are the kind of four, four main opportunities for them. Okay, so you, so you mentioned the PI cover, uh, and obviously for, for conveyancing, do, do you think there could be read across to brokers? Because PI cover is, is a bit of a challenge and is expensive for brokers. Do, do you think there may be some reward for, for participating or, or using these standards? Um, I forgot to mention brokers, and you're absolutely right. Yes. <laughs> so cheaper PI for brokers. Well, that's, that, that's going to go down very, very well. Fantastic. Yeah. So in terms of the uh, IDMV providers, the, the, there's a number in the market. I, mm -hmm. I see the announcement today you've uh, you've launched with five, one or two names that I, I, I'd not come across before, but, but it's a positive step. And mm -hmm. I think there's maybe one or two additions to come. How, how many more do you, do you expect? So we've got six on board now, as you quite rightly say, five announced today. We've got another one uh, coming on board in the next few weeks. And we have commitments from six to come on board in January. Now, as part of the project, we knew that not every identity provider would be ready to come on board in October. So we agreed with them that we'd have two onboarding stages, one in October, one in January. So we've got another six so far who've committed to coming on board in January. The, the five or six that are on board just now are quite an interesting crowd. Um, you've got two Yoti and Digi Identity who've been around for quite a long time in the world of identity. Um, if you, you probably recognize their names, both are coming at it in slightly different ways. But Yoti now um, are behind the post office identity called Easy ID. And Yoti have come at it from identity very much with the consumer focus. Um, if you look at, there's a company called Third Fort. Now, they've been on the market a couple of years, making great inroads into the conveyancing sector and the house buying and selling sector. 
very innovative in what they're doing, very customer focused, consumer focused. And then we've got two newer ones like Nuggets and um, Obid. Again, coming at it from different ways, but they're very much based on open banking and using open banking. And they've taken that approach because we've seen open banking in more recent times has come to the forefront. I know open banking has been around for a long time and everyone's kind of wondered about what was going to happen with it. But I think that use case has come to the forefront because COVID has accelerated the need for doing digital ID and V and government is now legislating on it. So the timing is just right. So we're seeing different types of identity providers responding to market needs. Fantastic. And, and I guess there's always been a concern around the liabilities and, and where they sit. Do, do you think you've got to a point where that's on out now and everybody understands what their liability is? I think so. We've, we've done a lot of work on, on that and with the likes of UK Finance as well about the liabilities. Um, to date, identity providers don't carry any liability because the process is, is I provide you with the information and it's entirely up to your own risk assessment to make a decision based on the information that I've given to you. But if you look through the scheme, the liability is now pushing back onto the identity providers because in the end, if they don't do what they're contractually meant to do or make a slip up in what they're doing, that get, then gives you a recourse. So they are actually having to carry liability now. And that is written into the contracts of the scheme, which might be of interest to people. Yeah, and, and, and that's a really positive outcome, Stuart. So I certainly welcome that um, from a point of view. It, it, it makes perfect sense to me. How can you, you know, mm -hmm. I think uh, these guys need to um, stand behind the system, as it were, and, and if they're as good as they, they say they are, to, to get the trust and everything moving forward, which yeah. is great. Um, you also mentioned that, uh, well, well I, I know that Imler have been involved, Amy have been involved. You've, said, you've mentioned UK finance, uh, the SEA mm -hmm. having it, you know, um, you know government are involved. It really sounds as if we've got all the major factions here really supporting this. But but are there certain areas whereby we need to get more support? Um, I think it's end user support now. We need to start getting lenders, the banks, the mortgage lenders, the brokers, um, and of course, conveyances and estate agents engaged in, in the ecosystem. Um, this is going into a pilot and from government down through regulators and representative bodies across the, across the, the four stakeholder groups, have all agreed there's an element of risk in this. And there's going to be a point where a consumer will go to Savills. So for example, Savills are, are working as part of the scheme. And I could get my ID and V done through Savills. And I then go and try and share that with a broker or a lender. And they go, no, no, I can't accept that. You have to get it done again. I think we've got to overcome that hurdle. And it's only by the industry working together, we can drive this forward. The confidence for the industry is knowing that there's government be backing behind it, there's regulatory, your regulators are behind it, your representative bodies are behind it. It is an industry scheme and it just requires us all to take it forward because the use case is simple. We've all bought and sold a house and one very frustrating part for us is doing the IDMV, which is just a, it's not a competitive issue, it's just an admin burden. I, I agree. And, and from my point of view, I'd, I'd like to see a lot more lenders engage here. I know we've got some on board, which is great. But, you know, lenders have, have, have moved, certainly pre-COVID, when they were all insisting that uh, a broker can use technology and, and projects such as this. But they still had to certify they'd seen original documentation, which I'm afraid in today's world is just, a, in my view, an unrealistic requirement. Mm -hmm. um, and it's ha ha you know, and a number moved through COVID because actually no one was going to see anybody. So you couldn't get documents to share. And thankfully, I think the vast majority have stayed in that position is now how do we get them to take the next step to to embrace what, what you're doing here and maybe in line with their current arrangements so actually proof of concept is, is, is absolutely right so I do call upon all, all lenders watching this to absolutely get involved and, and come and see what this is all about as I know some have but 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 there's always room for more and I think the more that come into the market the greater the confidence and the, the greater the outcome would be w would you share that view Stuart? Absolutely. And I think the, the industry needs to understand and have the confidence to know that their regulators will support them. And I'll give you a very good example for the estate agent sector were very reluctant to take part in the trial because of their fear of HMRC, because HMRC regulates them or supervises them. And just as you said, Danny, the estate agents have to see in their regulations, they have to see the original documentation 
HMRC, we have it on record now on video with HMRC have come out and told the estate agents, we will support you through this because they are changing their regulations over the next six to 18 months because they realize how archaic now their processes are. The digital IDMV is a far better, more secure way of doing it. So it's, it's the industry's moving, it's a shift that way. Okay, so a question has come in, Stuart, and it, it's, it's all about funding. So, so um, I know that some firms would have arrangements with IDPs already. Uh, how do you see the funding of these searches actually happen? Um, or is it sort of all taken care of behind the scenes? Uh, there's two ways that are happening. One, um, lenders, brokers may have an existing relationship with a IDP. And the scheme is still designed to support that because those contractual arra arrangements exist. And that's absolutely fine. So the scheme is not designed to have any adverse impact on any commercial agreements. However, the new introduction into the scheme is the ability for an estate agent, a broker, a lender, whoever it might be, to actually push the cost of getting the ID and V done directly onto the consumer. It's my identity. I control it. I want to share it. And this is very much meets under the objectives of DCMS about empowering us as, as, as citizens to control and manage our own identity. So this is where it's caught some of the IDPs, some of the more, can I use the term, traditional IDPs who've been operating in this space. They've been caught on the back foot and are not ready to meet the standards of the scheme about the ability to meet the needs of the consumer. Okay, I mean, that's positive to hear. So if brokers have got current arrangements with IDPs, then then that works. But, but I understand, you know, ultimately it could go to the customer. And realistic, I mean, a search is, is quite cheap anyway in the scheme of things. And even if it has to go up slightly in price, I, I don't think that, that that's a problem. Um, are you able to share what mortgage networks have, have been involved through this discussion process um, and, 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 and how that's sort of looking? And also, um, you know, if you get lender board, networks have their own compliance, which needs to be met. What, what's been the sort of feedback from, from the networks and how, the, how they've received it? From the couple of networks that we've been dealing with, it's been extremely positive. So this morning, for example, I did a session with Fluent Money um, and their broker network, and they brought on some of their panels, panel solicitors who've all said, yes, you know, overwhelmingly, the response we're getting is very positive. And we're engaging with others. So for example, Impact SF or FS, I always get that one wrong. So my apologies to them if they're on the call. Um, and again, the, the feedback to them is positive. With regards um, networks having their own compliance, well, everyone is working to one set of standards. There is only one set of compliance standards and the scheme is working to those standards. So whilst everyone is saying, oh, we have different standards, it's your interpretation of the standards might differ, but the standards are the exact same. And from a financial services sector, it's actually a lot easier because you're regulated by one regulatory body, UK finance. If you take the port conveyancers, they're regulated by CLC and SRA, and their standards conflict with each other. And then you've got the estate agents who are regulated or supervised by someone else. So in fact, it's a lot easier here within the um, financial services sector for you to comply. Okay. And I know that one or two of the large networks in the UK have also been part of the project and, and, and are involved too. So they're fully aware of, of, of what is going on. So I do expect more to come on board um, at that point. Um, Stuart, this has been great. We have actually unfortunately run out of time for today. Uh, if any of our viewers have further questions, please do um, uh, let, let's have them and I'll refer them to Stuart and we'll get a communication out with the answers. If you genuinely want to, to find out more, please do contact me at Legal and General Mortgage Club. And I'm very happy to put you in touch with Stuart uh, to talk through. This for me is a project that we have been waiting for for a long time. I still dare say there's still a lot of work to do, but someone's been bold enough to actually take it on and actually try and make a change in our industry for the better, not just for our brokers, but or for lenders, but for our customers too. So I suggest we get behind and support this because it's something we We've been crying out for a long time. Stuart, thank you ever so much for your time. Uh, those that have watched, thank you for, for coming to, to view this. And we look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Goodbye. Thank you very much for having me.